Hey, welcome to the Vortex Garage. We've got our 1989 Jaguar XJS convertible back on the lift. It's pretty much just wrapped up its major service. We've done a couple test drives. What we wanted to do was go ahead and bring you here and show you all the things that we've finished before we have some other videos ready. The main reason we're doing that is because our original plan was that we would do a couple weekends of work and have this thing running and driving and take it out on Easter Sunday. Well, Easter Sunday came and went, and we frankly found more things wrong with the car that simply needed to be addressed to do this properly and safely. So what we'll do today is kind of walk you through and show you all the things that we found and fixed. We'll talk about some of the things that we might have in the future for this vehicle and give you some details on how those initial test drives went. Of course, we're going to have more video to follow up on this once I get a chance to edit it because we did take a lot of video as we did some of the work on here. So things like the fuel system, uh, the EVAP system for the fuel tank, we have video for that. So we'll be cutting some extra videos for you to see. In the meantime, let's walk you through what we did. We're going to start with the ignition system. So starting with our ignition system, I think the biggest thing we wanted to point out here is we do have our single ignition coil set up. This car had already been moved over to that and converted, but I went ahead and replaced that with a brand new coil. We have the original one we can use as a backup. And uh, I removed the wiring harness that runs over here through that grommet and goes down to our secondary ignition. So since that, that secondary ignition coil had been decommissioned and isn't in use, I went ahead and pulled it out so we're not using it. I left it in there because it looks cool, but for the time being, we've got that pulled out. Now one thing, uh, in addition to removing that wiring and cleaning it up here, there's probably a big thing that you see missing, and that is our cruise control module. So we've removed the cruise control bellows for the time being, and one of the reasons is I kind of felt that it would be nice to just be able to have a little more access and check things as we're running. And frankly, in a lot of the driving I'm gonna do for this vehicle, I don't really plan to use cruise control. I'm gonna enjoy the vehicle and drive it. So I've temporarily decommissioned that. Let me show you how I routed that out of the way. So of course we've removed the bellows and we've also removed the wiring that goes to that. And well, I was just over there. I could have showed you that. We'll show you in a second. But what I wanted to show you and point out was here is the cable that goes to the pedal box for the cruise control. And I did leave that in the vehicle. So that's still connected to the pedal box assembly. But what I have done is I've left the original sheathing in place. But at this end, I've added some silicon hose that's a little extra long. And we've put a cap and uh, even crimp that cap on with a hose clamp, which I've put some heat shrink over, just so we wouldn't have any metal touching or any of these wires or anything. And uh, this basically gets it up out of the way. I can show you with the camera pretty easily, but if you kind of pick your head up, it sort of starts blending in with all the other hoses here. And uh, just got it zip tied to this support brace for the time being. Now, if I wanna go ahead and put the cruise back in, all I have to do is route the wiring, remove this end, put our hose or our line back over, put our bellows back in and it'll be recommissioned. But for the time being, I decided to leave it out so we'd have all that nice clearance visibility and it frankly cleans up the engine bay a little bit. Now back to this side for the wiring. Here you can see I've added some fabric tape, the high heat fabric tape, and uh, put another heat shrink just to clamp that on. This is the connector that's gonna stay in the harness and that can just stay out of the way here, do its own thing, and it is disconnected and it's never gonna touch anything. So in terms of our ignition system, I think that when you saw this before, the V was completely disassembled. We had the distributor out on the bench where we had rebuilt it uh, partially. We didn't rebuild every single seal and bearing on it, but we did take apart down to the uh, advanced assembly, took that fully apart, cleaned it, checked the springs, and lubricated them very lightly with some Crytox lubricant based on the Kirby book. Went ahead and reassembled them and validated that everything worked as it should. And uh, have since put the distributor back together and remounted it into the car. It slid right back in exactly where it came out. We didn't touch the motor. Of course, before I did that, I had taken the extra step to get it to top dead center on cylinder 1A. And uh, as a result, everything went back in, pointing exactly was, as it should and the way my markings were. Um, in fact, since we've started the vehicle and when we did the timing, the timing was actually quite close. So all in all, that went together pretty easily. Once we got the distributor back in, one thing I did was go ahead and reassemble our magnetic pickup, which is under there, and we set that to the correct gap for the CEI. That was one thing that we had kind of noted in one of our prior videos. We had put the wrong spec when we first got this running. So I've corrected that, and that's all back together with the reluctor wheel. 
And then the dust cover was an interesting one. So, you know, I always complain about aftermarket parts. And, uh, well, frankly, I ordered a new dust cover because the one I had had a chunk missing for one of the bolts. So I got the part, branded Jaguar, go to put it in, it does not fit. Oh boy, do I just love this kind of stuff. So I got the new plastic cover for our 12-cylinder Lucas CEI ignition. It's an authentic Jaguar part. And I line those holes up. Uh-oh. Okay, hang on. Let me line these up. Uh-oh. Let me flip it around. Uh-oh. So yeah, brand new, original part. Does not fit. Go check some forums and it turns out I'm not the only one who's had that issue and it's pretty well known that whoever makes that part for Jaguar Land Rover doesn't make it properly and Jaguar Land Rover just keeps selling them. So not an aftermarket part that I bought from some random shop, but an actual branded Jaguar Land Rover part, not an, a counterfeit, not even a counterfeit part. Doesn't fit. So don't buy it. Don't, don't waste your money on that. What I ended up doing, I put some high heat epoxy, fixed the little ear that broke off, and we got all four screws holding it down and went ahead and put it in. I know some people don't run the dust covers, but um, if I can put it back in, it's in good shape, I'm gonna put in what was there. But I was able to reuse the original. As you can see here, I had to epoxy a little piece that broke off. That'll hold, it'll be fine. Um, some people don't even run the dust cover. I'd like to run it, and fortunately, this one's intact enough to put back on since the other one didn't fit. Um, from there, we put the rotor, a new rotor and a cap on. And of course, we've also recommissioned and put all new hoses for our distributor vent system. And that goes up and around. Uh, well, this one goes up into our connection down in there. And then it's a little harder to see, but the one underneath, I routed an entirely new line, which you can start to see finally on the support there and into the filter. So that's the intake filter for it. And then I believe this one, if I remember correctly, and you'll, you all will correct me, the internet's good for that. Um, leave me a comment if I get this wrong, but I'm pretty sure that routes eventually to your AAV, and that's part of that system. So it helps bring fresh air into that distributor and keep fumes out of it. New seal going in with the, the cap as well, so everything's really good there. Of course, we had done the spark plugs, and uh, to go with those, we put new leads and everything is looking good. You might remember that one of our leads actually had a whole bunch of electrical tape on it. A few of the other leads were very dry rotted rubber when I took them out. They were actually starting to fall apart. So very, very good that we did that. So I think that's it for ignition. Let's talk about the fuel lines. And uh, well, this is where we're gonna talk a little bit about one of the videos I'm cutting, which is gonna be the steps that we took to repair and rebuild all these fuel lines. And as you can see here, our rail is in, our fuel lines are there. We've actually also gone through, all of our injectors have been overhauled. They've got new pintle caps, new basket filters, O-rings and seals. They've gone through ultrasonic cleaning. They went through a fuel injection test machine. We'll show you all that, but all of them, spray patterns are great. Flow characteristics are good across all of them. And we've got all new parts within them. Um, the only thing I didn't change was the wiring harness. I've actually purchased some stuff to rebuild a fresh harness from scratch which will be interesting. Uh, I don't know when I'm gonna have time to do that, so that might end up being a, dare I say, winter project, but I'm probably gonna wanna find a scrap harness to build off of. Now, when I took this one apart, it was actually in really good shape. Uh, even though it's old, and I'm sure the PCV wiring is gonna crack if I touch it, I really didn't see any reason not to use it. Now, the, for that age was also a reason I didn't feel comfortable just taking that wiring and moving it up. So a lot of people like to move it up to the pedestals up here and uh, I didn't want to do that because well, I plan on replacing it and it just seemed like I was going to disturb something that was already working well and was probably going to risk more trouble than it was worth. So I didn't do that, but uh, so far no issues, everything's running well. So the only main issue that I had was my own silliness. Um, I did a lot of this work after my main job and some nights were easier than others, but uh, uh, essentially, I had a lot of gaps of time in between working on some of this stuff, and it resulted in some mistakes in my mind. <laughs> and what I mean is, I actually had to do these rubber hoses twice. Uh, and the reason for that is I got a really great kit from Mr. Injector, and it looked like the lines were pre-cut. 
Well, when I took apart the original one, they were in such bad condition, they basically fell apart as I was removing them and cut them. Uh, and uh, what I was left with was just a pile of rubber scraps and none of them were complete. So even though I had that pile of scraps not far from me when I was working at the table reassembling this, I started putting them together and I forgot that, yeah, Mr. Injector, it looks like everything in that kit was so great. I thought they were pre-cut for this application. What turns out is they give you a little bit of extra of everything. Well, they give you a little bit of extra hose as well. It's up to you to trim it to the exact proper length to your specific car. And I think on this one, it's like one and three quarter inch for the 10. And then you pretty much mock it in and then cut these two to fit. Well, I didn't do any of that. And as a result, this was way too high. So I think it was about uh, a half an inch or three quarters of an inch extra length that it didn't need. And uh, as a result, I go to install it and all of a sudden I'm like, hey, it looked fine on the bench. I didn't think anything of it, but now that I'm assembling it, this rail is sitting up too high and you couldn't even attach these, uh, the uh, line, lines, the uh, or linkages for the throttle. So as a result, I, I caught it pretty quickly that it was an obvious issue and uh, ended up doing this just removing the uh, new lines I put on. Didn't want to chance it, so I picked up some new line and we got fresh line that hadn't been cut off and, and messed with and pulled on and tugged on and uh, reassembled those. So everything's looking good so far, leak free. Everything's looking nice. Now to go along with those, I wanted to replace anything else that was easy to access that was rubber. So most of the fuel lines going into the car have been replaced. You can see I've started writing on some of them. Probably I'll clean that off and maybe do like a tag of some kind. But I did want to mark just for edification and reference that these hoses had been replaced at a certain date, in this case, March 2024. And uh, well, on this side, this particular hose here that routes underneath and goes into our regulator on the back side of it, at least. Well, that line had been replaced by someone with just a piece of hose that went across the top of the manifold. So we cleaned that up. It's got the nice new proper line. Got a new line going into the rail here. This is actually, I think, the output of the rail that goes into that regulator. That goes into your fuel chiller and then out to your return. And then, of course, on this side, I'll just jump down to it here. We have our uh, feed from the tank. That's a new line with a new clamp. I went ahead and put a vacuum cap on the end of it just to keep it safe so it wouldn't rub on anything. That goes up and under and into our regulator here. And then we have this last one that goes into our rail. And this one, I don't know if you're staring at this like I am, but it's the only thing that I'm really looking at that I'm like not super thrilled with it. It's a brand new line, but I think it's just a little too long. Now, and the reason I say that is, look at this. It, it's not kinked, but it's got a pretty aggressive bend there. And it looks like it's only about a half an inch away from kinking. Now, once this thing pressurizes, it runs fine. I'm not detecting any issues. I don't believe there's any fuel delivery issues from it, but there's just, an, whether it's an OCD or just a quality aspect where I want things to be as perfect as possible, but that's just bugging me. Now, you're probably asking, hey, can you not adjust it? Well, I probably could. There's no adjustment here. This is, this is static, but I could loosen this and take the hose and you know, pivot the hose this way towards the this side of the vehicle. And that would basically pull this further away and that would loosen uh, that bend a little bit. And I may do that. Of course, now we've got some pressure in the system, so I'll have to do it carefully. Um, but I actually played around with that a little bit before I settled on it here. And what concerned me is if you come down kind of level here, if I do that, what I was afraid of is that this hose would then rise up too much. And if you look at it, there's a little bit of signs that it might possibly already be touching our insulation. And I just didn't want to get into a spot where it was going to rub. So what I'll probably do is just play with the adjustment. I think we do have some wiggle room here where we can move it up a little bit. And uh, we'll go ahead and do that. And uh, it's pretty easy to depressurize these systems. Just pull the relay in the back, you know, crank the car. And then all we got to do is loosen this, pivot this, tighten that. We can play around with it and try to get it right. So that's the only thing that I'm kind of just a little iffy on, but it doesn't seem to affect the running of the vehicle. And to wrap up our ignition and fuel discussion, um, we talked about how when we put the uh, distributor back in the vehicle, it started up no problem. Well, if I didn't mention that, it did. And it turned out we were actually only off a few degrees in our total timing. Um, we followed the steps. We timed it at 3000 RPM after warming the vehicle up. Didn't take video of that. It, it was a multi-person task. I basically had someone in the vehicle operating the throttle. I had considered maybe trying to rig up some sort of system here where I could put fine adjustments and hold this open. 
Um, but since I had someone here helping, they just sat in the car, pressed the accelerator pedal. I was underneath, I could see the RPM on the screen and kind of give them tips just in case the tachometer wasn't perfect. We got it right around 3000 RPM and I was able to get the timing light run over here, down under. The uh, timing marks on the engine are underneath. So I had the car up on the lift and uh, was able to check the timing marks, come up here. And then because I didn't have my cruise module in, I was able to reach, you see it down in there? There it is, that little lock, lock nut and uh, little screw there. That's your fine adjustment on your distributor. Now, assuming you're close enough on your timing and you've put your distributor in, you should have no problem using that. So a little bit of turning on that, checking, turning on that and checking. I was able to dial it in perfect and we've got it set. I think it's 18 degrees uh, at 3000 warmed up. And of course we did disconnect our, uh, our vacuum advance. So that's one more thing to show you. The vacuum advance capsule is kind of hidden and hard to get to. So that would be a pain. You can kind of see it po peeking out in there. So in order to not have to try to reach my big hands down in there every time I want to disconnect it, especially when the engine's warm, what I've done is I've routed our vacuum line up here and right around here, you can see right there, there's a union. So all I got to do is come in here and I can pop that union loose and I've disconnected my vacuum canister. Uh, so my vacuum advance. So that's what we did, timed it, put it all back together, took the car out and it seems to be driving great. I think we've covered most everything here under the bonnet except the braking system. And well, since I'm here, let's go ahead and chat a little bit. So since I'm on this side and we're right near it, here is our, uh, I'll go ahead and turn the light back on. Here is our ABS pump. And this is the pressure ball. This is the pressure accumulator for the pump that holds pressure to operate the brakes. And then the pump basically keeps this pressurized. That way you're not running the pump all the time. Now it's pretty common for these to wear out over time. They're nitrogen filled. And the one I had seemed to be working. Oh, it took a little while to pump up, but I, I figured, hey, I'm in here. I'm, I got everything depressurized. I'm gonna replace it. Now first and very obvious, you definitely, cause it says it on it, you don't wanna take this off when there's any pressure in the system. This thing holds over 2000, up to 3000 PSI of pressure. You start taking this off, it springs a leak. It's gonna shoot pressure out at such velocity, it'll literally cut you open. So you ever seen a water jet cutting metal? All right, they use high pressure with abrasives in it, but imagine a high pressure fluid, or this is an issue with diesel pumps as well. You can literally severely injure yourself with the spray of one of these. So you wanna get the pressure out of the system. Now to do that, as long as the car is not running and your pump's not operating, you just depress the pedal like 20 times. You'll feel it get harder and harder. When it gets really rock hard, it means you've pretty much gotten the pressure out of the system. So we went ahead and did that. And when we removed it, um, we had a little catch can underneath. And yeah, you had some fluid leak out, but we didn't really have an issue. I wrapped it with a rag just in case. Didn't experience any spraying of, of fluid, which was nice. Now to get this thing off, let's show you the old one. I'm not even gonna take it over to the car because it's still got some fluid in it. But this is the original one, which is a little bigger than the one that's on it. We'll talk about that in a second, but these things are really hard to get off. And if you look, it's got a little hex fitting in there for like an Allen key. I think it's an eight millimeter, five sixteenths. Unfortunately, the torque required to remove this from being on there for so long, it just, there was no hope. The, the metal's too soft. It, it was turning, it was gonna round out. So I kind of knew that might happen based on looking at it. So we had to come up with something else. Now, as you're doing that, and uh, when I show you what I use, this is very important. Uh, this pump is mounted with rubber bushings. So as you're trying to turn this thing off or even install it and put it on, uh, you're putting a lot of pressure on those and you can basically twist the thing off or damage those rubber bushes. So I needed to brace this. So I did two things. First, I took a two by four, cut a chunk off and used that in here and braced the, the side of the pump motor but then I took a giant channel lock and found a good spot where I was able to grip the metal casing and basically hold against any of the turning I was doing. Now, the first thing I tried after my socket didn't work is I went ahead and tried a strap wrench. That didn't work for me. So let me show you what I ended up using because it's right here. I ended up using a really big pipe wrench <laughs> and that worked really well. That took it off no problem. So one arm on the pipe wrench, one arm on the channel locks. If you got a helper, that's even better. And once I was able to break that thing loose, it just spun off by hand, no problem. Now, you'll, as we noted, this one's a lot smaller. This turns out to be a pressure ball that, or a uh, accumulator that others have used based on some research. 
It's a Bosch part. You can see the part number there, and we'll flash it on the screen. And uh, this Bosch part's pretty inexpensive. And the nice thing about it is being a little smaller, it gives you a little more room here between the upright, the, between the support beam. Um, and uh, so far, I've experienced no issues with braking. It fills up a little quicker. It doesn't seem to refill any longer or more than the other one did. That's what others have reported. So others seem to have had good luck with this. So far in the test drives, it's operated just fine. Now, before I put that on, um, of course, our reservoir is over there. You've got a hose that runs, and that hose comes in the here, goes into your pump. And if you look down in here, you've got a little clip. If you pull that clip out, you can wiggle this, this hose out. It's got a plastic uh, like elbow. And it's got some O-rings on it. Now, when I did this, I didn't have the O-rings for it. Of course, I have a bunch of O-rings in stock, but being that it's in brake fluid, I'd probably want a Viton O-ring or something specific to brake fluid. I don't even remember what's good for brake fluid, but um, at any rate, I'd probably recommend that you make sure you have O-rings for this so you replace them proactively. Fortunately, I was able to pull this off, put it back on, no leaks. Why did I do it? You don't have to do that to replace this, by the way. You don't have to. But I pulled that off because I didn't want any old fluid going in here. The fluid in it was nasty. And uh, what I ended up doing was putting my pressure bleeder on the reservoir there and uh, was able to, you know, just with a little bit of pressure, because it's just almost a gravity feed would have done it, pulled this off into a container and went ahead and drained it out and replaced all the fluid. So all the fluid, brand new from the reservoir all the way over to here. That way, when we operated this, it would pump fresh fluid pretty much into our pressure ball. I also cracked the bleeders on the front and let some of that drain out. So again, we did our best to try to push fluid through all this before we turned the car on and filled up our, our pump here, our reservoir. Pressure accumulator, whatever you want to call it. It's a lot of talking without a script, <laughs> right? So um, I will say this, on the brakes and the brake bleeding, before I tell you about the brakes, which was probably the hardest part of working on this car was in fact the braking system. I had a lot of issues with aftermarket parts, but the bleeding of this ABS system is a bit tricky. Uh, to bleed the backs, you're gonna need the car on, or at least you know the ignition on, so the pump runs. And you, you basically run the pump for 15 seconds with the bleeder open, to, and then you close the bleeder, shut it off, you let it rest for about 90 seconds, and you do that over and over. You don't wanna burn the pump motor out, but you're actually using the pump to, prep, to get fluid out of the bleeder screws in the back. So we did that with a helper. The fronts, uh, you should be able to do fairly conventionally. Um, from what I have read and even experienced, I think it's probably better to have the ignition on for that and let the pump run. I did experience when I didn't do that, it felt like, A, with the pressure bleeder, you just get a dribble out of the front. Like it wouldn't be like on a normal vehicle. Uh, so I was able to do that and just put buckets under them and let them run when I replaced the calipers to get the main bleeding done. But I did a classical, someone helping, you know, pushing the pedal and all that good stuff. And uh, um, it just seemed that some of the times there wasn't a lot coming out when they would press the pedal down. So um, I think there's some updated details on one of the forums that says it might be best to do it with the car running. But we have successfully bled the brakes and the brakes feel pretty good. I am gonna pull a wheel. We'll talk about brakes a little bit and a few other things. But before I do that, I missed one thing that's kind of important. A lot of these vacuum lines have all been replaced. So whenever I had an accessible vacuum line under here, put a new one in. Go into our regulator, wherever, you, you name it, we went ahead and put a new one in. All right, so we've got our Jag up on the lift and I've pulled off one of the wheels so we can show you that we've got a new caliper on here. We're gonna talk a little bit about some interesting things that we dealt with with this. Now, first of all, I think we had talked originally in some of the earlier inspections that the prior owner gave me some parts, gave me some new Bosch brake pads for the front. These nice Bosch quiet cast brake pads, probably what I would have picked based on what's available, as well as a pair of calipers for the front. Well, what I had noticed on the car during the, the inspections was that this wheel was very tight and it felt like maybe the caliper was sticking. So I had planned, well, hey, gave me new calipers. Let's go ahead and just throw those on because we're doing all the bleeding of the brake system anyway. It shouldn't be a big deal. So I go and I find the calipers, pull them out, take them out of the box, look at the one, the bleeder's not in the right spot. Okay, no problem. I, I pulled out the right-hand one. Let me go to the other box and get the left-hand one. Go to the box, pull out the other one. Bleeder's not right. Look at the part numbers. There are two right-hand side calipers. So I didn't have a left-hand caliper. So I'm sitting here and I'm like, I'm really close to having this car done. 
struggling with the back brakes, now working on the fronts, and I'm like, I just don't want to wait another week. What I ended up doing, I looked up and it turned out my local AutoZone had Jag calipers in stock. And that's what this is. This is a rebuilt uh, girling caliper. At least it used to say girling on it somewhere. This one doesn't appear to have it. Um, we'll show you with the other camera since I have it on here, but uh, they actually weren't that expensive. And uh, I don't think they're a long-term solution for me. Uh, what I'd like to do is actually refurbish and totally rebuild the originals with uh, stainless uh, pistons and really good stuff. But in the meantime, the amount of driving I'm doing and what I want to do, I just wanted something that's going to work and, and be safer than the old originals that appeared to be locking up. Now, when I first did this, I went out and bought a left-hand caliper because I had two right-hand calipers already. So why buy things you don't need? So I bought myself a left-hand caliper. That's it. Came home, get back, start working on the other side and uh, putting on the caliper that the guy gave me. I think it was a Centric brand, just saying it how it is. Not saying, I don't know anything about Centric. I've never used their parts before. But I, it was obviously a rebuilt, had the girling label on it. And uh, I go to put it in, take these nice Bosch pads, and they just will not fit. They won't fit at all. Now, I, I get it, you're thinking, I know, if you know these cars, you're thinking, hey, Bet your Vortex garage doesn't know there's shims under there and you got to shim that. I saw the shims, not the first time, grant you, because they fell out and I had forgotten about them. And they fell out and they're so quiet, I didn't hear them hit the ground. And, uh, and then I saw them after I bolted the caliper in. So I got to do that job twice. But I had the shims in there and, and frankly, I, you know, looked like the caliper was properly centered. Everything looked good, but the pads wouldn't fit. And uh, I'm like, well, I think the issue is that the pistons on the Centric were sticking out a little bit and nothing I could do seemed to retract them enough. I could get one of the, the um, pads in, but not the other. So just to get the thing back together, I threw one of the old pads back in and one new pad. Don't, don't, I wouldn't even keep it that way. I didn't keep it that way. So then I decided, well, you know what? I think there's something wrong with this, this uh, caliper. Tried the other one. I have two right-hand calipers. Tried the other one. Same problem. So then I started doing this side and this one with the AutoZone one, it fit better. They were still very tight for some reason. The pads were very tight, but I was able to install them. So I figured, okay, what, whoever built these for AutoZone, whatever parts they use, maybe they're inferior. Maybe, maybe Centric has the better parts and they're just not, who knows? I'm not jumping the conclusions here. I'm just telling you what I had happen. Well, AutoZone seems to be working. I want to get this thing on the road, go up to AutoZone and get a right-hand caliper. And uh, while I'm up there, I decided, you know, I've been kind of messing with these Bosch pads. Let me pick up a set of pads from AutoZone. So I grabbed a set of their pads, semi-metallics, get them back. And I don't know where my Bosch pads are. Let me just put it that way. So I'm just gonna hold these two dirty old pads as an example. So these pads, the way they work on these calipers, and many of you know this, is they, they slide in to the side of the caliper, you know, on either side of the rotor. So they slide in, sandwich in like that. What I found was on the AutoZone pads, they were designed similar to this. They had two uh, uh, gas relief channels in them or sound channels, whatever those are. Uh, but they actually had a bit of chamfering on the edge, whereas the Bosch's didn't. The Bosch's were kind of like these used pads. They were they're just totally square. Well, the other thing I noticed was the AutoZone pads were a very small amount thinner in material size. And I'm just getting my hands dirty to make a point. So anyway, I get the uh, AutoZone pads back. And now by this point, I've already written off the centric uh, calipers, put the new AutoZone caliper on, on, on the right-hand side there. And I go to install the pads. Now remember, the, the Bosch pads were still tight on this one. Like you'd put it in and you go to turn it and you'd feel it. Anyway, I go to put the AutoZone ones in and they slide in perfectly, just like they should. I've done JAG brakes before and these style of brakes, they're super easy to do. And those just went in like no problem whatsoever. So I assembled these back together with the AutoZone calipers and the AutoZone pads and they're operating just perfectly so far. Now I do believe the centric calipers are probably fine, but the centric calipers mixed in with the slightly thicker Bosch calipers were just a no-go for me. Not calipers, Bosch pads. So 
I think that I would probably say, I'm not sure I'm going to do those Bosch pads if I do my XJ6. I'll probably get another alternative. Um, but definitely the chamfer and the literally maybe a millimeter difference, if not even a half a millimeter difference in pad height. Like it was, that was enough to make the install really, really easy, really, really good. Uh, the other thing that's odd is the caliber anchor bolts use mechanics wire, or lock wire between them. And the stuff that I have is this really hard to use stainless stuff. And I should have gotten something different. So it was a pain to have to do that a couple times. And uh, I ended up putting blue Loctite on the bolts and redoing the wire, even though I did a crummy job with it. I figure it's better than not having it. But the blue Loctite, you know, really, I, I don't see why you need the lock wire if you've got a good Loctite. Probably could use red on it, but considering how far the threads are in there, you got to use heat to get them out. I figured blue will just make it repairable in the future. Now, in terms of getting the old calipers out, the bolts on the back were pretty tough. And I was really concerned because I've heard a lot of horror stories about them being really rusted on there. And for sure, just with a basic set of tools, they weren't really wanting to come out. So I jumped right into the heat. So I pulled out my hot rod. This is an inductive heater. It's come in very handy. I think there's more powerful ones out there since I purchased this one years ago. Um, but it works well. It, and it's not as good as a torch, but you also don't have an open flame running and I don't have to haul the tanks around. So for a lot of things, plug this thing in, zap the end of it, get some heat in the thing. And uh, once I did that and I used a larger impact gun on it and just carefully walked it back and forth, they came out. I didn't get any pictures of them, but fortunately the bolts, no rust. Bolts are very solid, didn't have to do that. But I've definitely heard, and especially cars that are older or have more rust issues, those caliper anchor bolts could be deteriorated. So just be aware and be prepared when you take them out, you might find that they need to be replaced before you can reassemble them. We'll get you some close-ups really quick and calipers on. Let's just show you the side here. We've got our AutoZone pads in there. Everything's looking pretty good. And yeah, pad swap didn't replace the rotors. Rotors are fine. For the job we're doing now, just getting this thing back on the road, it was good enough. So two new calipers up front, but unfortunately one new caliper in the back. So uh, I don't know if we had any film for this. I think I might have had a little, um, but essentially we knew that this was a completely seized caliper back here. I really tried valiantly to unstick it uh, and just was simply not able to. So as a result, I was able to order up a, a new caliper and uh, replace that. I've actually got parts to do the entire thing back here but I didn't want to drop the assembly. Um, and so what I did is I did it in place. And uh, just to have a little extra room, I did pull this exhaust pipe out. That gave me room on the other side. You can kind of see the bolts back in there. Um, they're able, I was able to get to them. It was a lot of turn at quarter turn at a time kind of deal. I was able to get it out. Fortunately, the caliper came with a crossover pipe here. Not all of them do. If you don't get that, be prepared to make one. Um, because it was really rusty because you get a lot more road stuff up in here and it, a lot less chance for things to dry out. And there's a lot of heat back here as well. So that was chewed up, would have never come off. I think it broke when I tried to take it off. And this one also snapped when I took it off. So I had to make a new line up to our flex line there. So eventually we will drop the cage out and rebuild it. But in the meantime, I was able to swap that one caliper. This one seems fine, was able to bleed everything. We got our pads in there and yeah, we pad swapped it. That rotor looks okay. Of course, you know, cause you saw in the inspection video, this rotor is torched on the one side. So hopefully these will bed in somewhat decently, <laughs> but uh, suffice to say, we're gonna be back here doing more work. I did pull this plate down and check everything. I ended up putting some new bolts in the edges. And while I was back here, I pulled the drain plug. Uh, and first I made sure I could open the fill plug. I always forget to do that. Um, but we did put new gear fluid in here too. And uh, I don't think it's leaking. I think that's uh, leftovers, um, hopefully. I think it's from when I made a mess. But uh, so we got new gear fluid in here. So that was pretty much our braking debacle. Uh, we got everything except one caliper replaced. And of course the rotors back here definitely need to be replaced, but that'll be at another time. So the last thing that is important to talk about in here is you knew we had an issue with our tank venting. And uh, since we're back here, we can kind of show you some of that. So up there, you can see that hose. See where it kind of looks like maybe there's a new section there. Well, look, I can just point. I think in the video I used a laser pointer on some of this. But uh, anyway, this right here is our... Did I forget to cut a zip tie? 
that's out of the way. Um, this one right here is where we used to have a check valve. So this is for our tank venting system and that actually runs down and then under the vehicle all the way to the front. And uh, the issue we were having is this did not have the recall done that was originally scheduled to be done. And this little section here is where a two PSI or so check valve would be. I was able to confirm that was not functioning. So I removed it, put uh, a bridge piece in and now have that with no check valve going. So basically anytime the pressure is going to vent through there, but I didn't leave it like that. Let's go up to the front and I'll show you why. This is our tank venting system that we worked. So that line comes out, goes through our left hand wheel well, and then it goes behind this plate. Behind this plastic piece is our charcoal canister and some more hoses for our EVAP system. So this is definitely one area we're gonna have more video on, how we diagnosed and resolved our tank venting issue on our XJS and some of the differences we found in the convertible. Essentially what's behind here, and we'll show you with pictures, we've added a uh, Rochester valve, uh, which has a vacuum actuator on it to basically open up the venting when the vehicle's running. Uh, plus uh, that Rochester valve, I believe, has a two PSI uh, where it'll overcome. So if we build up any uh, appreciable pressure in the tank, that'll come through the line here and it will vent into the charcoal canister appropriately. And uh, definitely we've proven this is working because when we go to the tank anytime, no matter what the temperature changes are, I open the, the flapper, I don't get a rush of air uh, coming out. I don't hear the tank oil canning anymore. So I'm glad we fixed that. So I did add um, on the charcoal canister side between the Rochester valve, I put a fuel filter uh, based on details from the Kirby book. I should have done both sides, but I only had one fuel filter. So I just did it and I figured, well, it's probably more important to have it on the charcoal canister side because little pieces of charcoal could come through, get sucked into the Rochester valve and stick it open. Of course, we'll show you with pictures and kind of have a full video when we went through that. Now, up in the engine bay, there's another Rochester style valve that's for the PCV and the EVAP system in the engine. And that's got the delay check valves on it and all that, the red and white one. You don't know what that is? Don't worry. Eventually we'll have a video. We'll show you that. I had to figure out what all that was. You'll see me do some learning. So since we've done a fair bit of work on this vehicle, there was a lot of things that I wasn't sure that I was, had remembered to cover. And it also explains why we didn't make our Easter date that we had planned to take this for its first drive. So uh, let's see, we talked about the fuel lines and hoses, vacuum lines, the fuel line thermo switch up under the bonnet. Uh, broken like all the others on a lot of these vehicles. I've left it bypassed for the time being. I think I talk about that in some of the future videos. Um, Remove the cruise module, rebuilt the distributor, cap rotor, pickup plate, wires, plugs, distributor vent system. We did pop new air filters into the panels when we had them open. Uh, the tank venting system. Talked a little bit about the overall EVAP and PCV system. I did clean the PCV valve. Um, I didn't replace it because it was in really good shape. Um, so apparently the PCV valves on these cars, very hard to find. There's actually a Motorcraft one, uh, part number EV. 225 from Motorcraft. I believe this is for a V6 Ranger. And apparently it operates at the same characteristics and has the same uh, sizes on either end that it can be used in replacement. Um, so I have one of those. I actually purchased it not knowing if my PCV system was okay. I wanted to try to clean it first. Um, my valve cleaned up seems to operate perfectly. So I put the original one back in. I'm gonna throw this in the box and have it as a spare. But uh, if you do have a damaged PCV, and you need to replace the valve. They're hard to find, they're very expensive. From what I understand, I haven't used it, so I can't claim for sure, but EV225 from Motorcraft, give that one a try. All right, I uh, think that's it, um, except the test drive. So really quick, uh, we'll comment, we did a few test drives. Um, I've only had it out a couple times because I've been, unfortunately when I'm free, it's pouring down rain. Uh, so the few times I was able to get it out in some nicer weather, we did put a little bit of miles on it and basically get it out and kind of prove it a little bit. But on one of the other test drives, I noticed when I took it out to speed, when I got to 55 to 60, I got a pretty good shake in the steering wheel. Uh, it wasn't horrible, but it was concerning. And we have new tires and they've been balanced and supposedly were balanced properly. Um, I suppose it's possible that maybe the tires aren't balanced as well as they could, maybe the wheels being older. Um, so it could be a wheel balance issue, but one of the reasons I did throw it back on the lift to do this video was to just do another inspection underneath and make sure nothing else is wrong. It could be something as simple as, you know, control arm bushings, you know, ball joints, things like that. 
So far, tugging on the wheels when the tires are on, there's no obvious play just by doing that. Um, the vibration went away as soon as I slowed down below 55. I, in that short drive, that was at the end of a test drive and the rain was coming. So I need to take it back out and really see, is it just a period of time that it vibrates? And maybe it's a tire issue. You know, they are new tires, hopefully not. Uh, maybe it's a balance issue or maybe there's something on the suspension causing us a bit of an issue here. There's a lot of original parts still, so it's entirely possible, but I figure before I take it out again, I just get it in here, do this video, and just go through and check, make sure there's nothing loose, something I missed that's gonna be really scary and detrimental on a test drive or you know, cause, a, cause a catastrophic problem. <laughs> so you know, since I have that opportunity, we're gonna check all that out. But really on, on the test drives that we've done so far, that's really the only complaint, and it wasn't horrible, it was just, you know, the white one, it's so smooth when you take it out. This one had some noticeable vibrations at speed. So we're going to want to figure that out. You know, other than that, it, it had really good power. It was very smooth. It idles very smooth. I think we talked about the, the one thing that I could still do. I did not play around at all with two things that you probably noticed. There's probably more things I didn't do that you're thinking of, but the auxiliary air valve didn't even look at it. And I didn't check the throttle plates when they're closed, which I should have done, but kind of forgot. Uh, and the thing seems to run really well. The only complaint, it idles a little low, um, but just a tad low. And once you're driving, no problem. And even when you're in gear idling, it's, it's right where it should be at in gear. It doesn't shake. It doesn't, you know, when it's cold, there's a little bit of hesitation right when you take off if it's like really, really cold. So you let the thing warm up and it's perfect. So I think there's some work we could do with that whole system, making sure that we don't have another vacuum leak we're not sure of our throttle plates are adjusted right, you know, our butterflies, uh, and the AAV, the air valve, um, being that it's a thermal driven thing, uh, have not even looked at it. I'd probably like to get a spare and rebuild a spare and pop that in. But in the meantime, it's on my list, my short list, I'll probably need to just inspect that. But so far, starts great, runs great, really no issues. So at least we can get the thing out and enjoy it. So we'll go ahead and wrap up here. Now, if you like this car and you like some of the things that we do, do us a favor, like, subscribe, all that. Hopefully, I mean, if you're still watching it now, you probably already did that. So I don't even know why I say it. But uh, at any rate, I enjoy that you're here and that you like the videos. We love sharing the projects that we do. We also like the input that you have. I know a lot of you have these cars, have tons of experience. You're getting to watch me learn all about the XJS, all about the V12, hopefully become an expert on them. Um, but you'll see as I go along, I'm going to make a few errors here and there. And I'm going to all go, hmm, I learned something. I'm going to go redo something I did. <laughs> so, um, but hopefully uh, what you see is that we've done a pretty good job on the car so far and that we're curating and bringing this one back to life in good fashion. So join us for more here on Vortex Garage. Until then, we'll see you around.